Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Aaron Moss, uh, and I'm a senior research scientist at Cloud Research. And today, our team's going to discuss an issue that's been on a lot of people's minds over the last couple of years, and like so many other things, has really accelerated with the pandemic, and that's online data quality. So our goal is to share what we know about collecting quality data on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we hope to provide you with an understanding of some of the um, threats to data quality on MTurk, as well as to describe the solutions that we've developed and then explain how you can uh, mitigate some of the threats to data quality in your own research. So our presentation is scheduled to last about 35 minutes. So although I realize many people may already be uh, using cloud research, I wanna begin by giving you a brief background of our company. So the cloud research team really comes from academia. Both Blade Lippman and Jonathan Robinson, who co-founded the company, are professors at Lander College in New York. And in 2010, when academic researchers first began using platforms like Mechanical Turk for research, Lave and Jonathan saw the potential of the internet as a place to connect with research participants. They began developing tools and technology that would enhance the capabilities of behavioral scientists running online studies, and they created what eventually became Cloud Research's MTurk Toolkit. For anyone who may be unfamiliar, our MTurk Toolkit connects to Mechanical Turk through API integration, and allows researchers to set up and manage MTurk studies through cloud research. The cloud research interface provides all sorts of tools that make running studies uh, easier, like setting criteria for who is eligible or ineligible for a study, targeting participants based on previously profiled demographic information, and providing the ability to communicate with participants by email, which is critical for things like longitudinal studies. In addition, the cloud research system uh, greatly simplifies the process of setting up and managing MTurk studies by providing a more friendly user interface and streamlining many manual tasks. And just to make sure it's perfectly clear, when you uh, use cloud research in this way, you're actually accessing the same participants that you would if you set up your study directly on Mechanical Turk. But as we'll talk about more today, you can also access a special group of participants uh, that we have vetted and deemed high quality, and we call these participants cloud research approved participants. So in addition to our MTurk toolkit, Cloud Research offers access to participants through our Prime Panels platform, which is a separate and much larger platform for online data collection. So similar to Lucid or Qualtrics, uh, Prime Panels aggregates hundreds of online panels together and allows researchers to access more than 50 million participants worldwide, which makes it especially useful when researchers want to gather a very large sample, gather a more representative sample, such as one matched to the demographics of the US Census, or to target participants based on very narrow and specific demographic targeting criteria. So although we're not going to talk about prime panels today, we actually use some of the same data quality tools that we're going to present um, in order to improve data quality on prime panels. And these tools um, help researchers ensure that they're gathering high quality data, regardless of the source of their online participants. So in addition to helping develop uh, our research tools, Lab leads our research team, which includes myself and Kasky Rosenzweig. And the primary goal of our research team is to take the forefront of advancements in online research. We aim to publish a number of papers each year that describe novel solutions to problems such as maintaining data quality, issues of online sampling, and uh, overall online research methods. We'll share a list of these resources after today's presentation, but you can also find them on our website. We hope they're helpful to you and your research. In addition to uh, these resources, Lave and Jonathan have recently published a book that's titled Conducting Online Research on Amazon Mechanical Turk and Beyond. And this book is part of the Innovations and Research Methods series uh, presented by SAGE. So with that, let's take a look at today's agenda. Our webinar has three main portions. First, we're gonna provide a brief history of data quality on Mechanical Turk. We'll talk a little bit about Mechanical Turk in its early days, and then we'll describe some of the problems uh, with data quality that emerged over the last two years or so. From there, we're gonna talk about work that cloud research has done to screen and vet the MTurk population. We'll show the demographics of participants that we have approved, and also show you some of the data we've gathered to assess data quality from this group. Finally, we'll discuss the data quality solutions that we've developed uh, to improve participants and that we are employing more broadly outside of Mechanical Turk to improve data quality in online studies. So overall, we hope our session is informative and that you come away with new insights into the root causes of bad data and the tools at your disposal to combat these issues. And so let's talk a little bit about Mechanical Turk. At this point, I uh, assume that most people probably know something about the beginning of Mechanical Turk. 
MTurk began as a microtask platform in 2005. And then around 2010 or 2011, behavioral scientists began using Mechanical Turk for research, and its growth among academic researchers really exploded from there. And it's just one testament to how M uh, popular MTurk became. Studies using MTurk data have now been cited in more than 1,000 different academic journals. And so there was a lot of attention that was directed towards uh, Mechanical Turk by the academic community. And one benefit of this attention is that uh, researchers learned a lot about the platform's strengths and weaknesses in a relatively short amount of time. For example, one of the most critical questions early on about Mechanical Turk really revolved around data quality. Given that researchers don't see online participants, many uh, people approached online data collection with a healthy dose of skepticism. However, what a number of uh, early studies really bore out was that data quality was a relative strength of Mechanical Turk. So studies found that participants passed attention checks at a much higher rate than student or community samples. Uh, participants on Mechanical Turk provided quality responses to surveys, regardless of the amount of compensation that was offered. When researchers uh, looked to compare, um, to replicate effects on Mechanical Turk that had been found in nationally representative probability samples, uh, they compared hundreds of effects and found that the vast majority also replicated on Mechanical Turk. And then perhaps most impressively, researchers were able to replicate reaction time studies all the way down to the range of 20 milliseconds, which was an indication that participants on Mechanical Turk were attentive and engaged. But then in the summer of 2018, some issues with data quality emerged. Researchers detected some signs of low quality data that many people quickly suspected may indicate potential fraud, some form of automation, or potentially even bots. So if you were conducting research and anywhere near social media at the time, I'm sure that you remember information about this issue circulated widely and quickly. Within hours, there was a full-blown bot panic within the academic community, and within days, articles were appearing in places like Wired and the New Scientist claiming that Mechanical Turk was, quote, ruining social science. So luckily for me, all this excitement with Mechanical Turk began to unfold when I was in just my uh, first month on the job at Cloud Research. And so I got really thrown right into the fire of trying to help figure out what was going on. And here's where I'm gonna turn it over to Labe, who's gonna uh, describe some of the actions our team started to take right away to investigate what was happening on Mechanical Turk. Uh, thank you, Aaron. So um, as soon as this problem emerged, we began trying to solve it. And our first goal was to understand the source of this sudden surge of bad data on Mechanical Turk. And our second goal was, of course, to try to create some solutions to this problem. The first thing that we wanted to understand was whether this problem was coming from bots, as was widely being claimed, or whether it was coming from people, or perhaps people using some sort of automation. Uh, we thought knowing more about the problem would help us create the right type of solution. Uh, on our end, we were seeing multiple signals that were suggesting that these were actually people and not bots. And based on our previous work looking into data quality on Mechanical Turk, many of the patterns we were seeing were pointing to people coming from India. Now, India has always been the second largest source of workers on MTurk, uh, second only to the US, and data quality from India has been consistently relatively poor. Many of the open-ended responses, for example, that uh, we were seeing and others were reporting in studies open only to workers in the US had grammatical mistakes consistent with people from outside of the US posing as US workers in order to take more studies. And perhaps most importantly, the IP addresses and geolocations of problematic workers who were supposed to be in the United States could be traced to virtual private networks that pointed to countries outside of the US. And so this seemed like a good first place to look in terms of understanding where that bad data was coming from. And so to see whether our hunch about India was on the right track, we developed a linguistic instrument to detect non-US based English language speakers. Uh, this instrument has several cultural questions where English words in the United States and other Western countries differ from English words in countries such as India. So for example, an eggplant in India is referred to as a brinjal. A period in India is referred to as a full stop. And a trash can is referred to as a dustbin. And so as part of this instrument, people are shown pictures of various objects and are asked to write down the answer as an open-ended 
response to identify what that object is. And what we found was that among non-problematic respondents who provide good quality data, almost no one used the word Brinjal. But close to 50% of problematic respondents on MTurk described an eggplant as a Brinjal. And the data were even more compelling across the entire instrument. Um, among problematic respondents, a full 95% described at least one of these objects as a non-US English speaker would. And this strongly suggested that people from outside of the US were able to create US MTurk accounts and to take studies that were only open to US-based participants. And what we found was that many of these participants are the same ones who are providing very low quality data, resulting in the erosion of data quality across the entire MTurk platform starting in 2018. It's interesting to know that over the last two years, uh, this pattern really didn't change. Uh, the figure on the left comes from the original study that we conducted in August of 2018, and the figure on the right was conducted just recently in uh, 2020. And so overall, this helped us to identify one source of problematic respondents on Mechanical Turk. Those were out of the country people who were posing uh, fraudulently as workers inside the US. Uh, and there was actually much other data pointing to this kind of human activity. So for example, we routinely detected intact conceptual priming effects among problematic respondents. Um, and this would be unlikely if there was no human reading the questions. We also saw perfect pass rates of uh, reCAPTCHA and honeypot questions, which are all common methods used to detect computerized behavior. Um, and there are several other things that we learned about these people. So for example, there is no single profile that they all fit into, and there's, no, uh, and there's a, a considerable performance heterogeneity across measures. Uh, simple one sentence manipulations often replicate. However, longer, more complex manipulations typically don't. And again, we think that this is because at least some of these people are reading and understanding simple questions, but have a harder time with longer, more complex English language passages. Uh, we also know that certain workers have multiple accounts on MTurk. In other words, one worker might have multiple um, worker IDs. Using our digital fingerprinting technology, we see multiple foreign accounts linked to the same computer. And when this happens, we often see that the identical open-ended responses will be provided by two different workers coming from the same computer. Um, and also we see that these individuals are participating in studies, uh, not only on Mechanical Turk, but these very people are participating on other market research platforms online. Uh, because we see traffic across hundreds of platforms through our prime panel system, we can track the same problematic participants across multiple platforms to the same computer through their digital fingerprint. And so uh, to summarize, we believe that problematic data on MTurk is primarily coming from people outside of the United States who pose as being based in the US. And while we of course cannot uh, completely rule out the idea that some bots are also completing some, completing some studies on MTurk, and in fact, I don't think this uh, can ever really be complete, uh, completely ruled out, uh, the bulk of our evidence does not support this idea and point in that direction. Um, instead, uh, the bulk of our evidence is pointing to real people coming from outside of the United States. And there's one other important thing that we learned, and that's that these foreign account holders are capable of adapting their behavior over time. Um, and this actually brings us to a discussion of the tools that we built to prevent them from accessing studies on MTurk. And so here I'll go back again to uh, 2018. When the data quality problems on, on Mechanical Turk first emerged, one of the most consistent and clear patterns that we and others were seeing on Mechanical Turk was that bad data was associated with virtual private networks. Uh, now, such activity can be traced with uh, IP addresses and geolocation tracking. And so we therefore created several tools to identify suspicious IP addresses and geolocations to block that traffic on MTurk. Uh, and these tools became available on cloud research around August of 2018. Uh, and this was a very effective approach at the time. Uh, similar tools were developed by other teams like Ryan Kennedy and his uh, collaborators. Uh, and this became a fairly standard way of protecting the MTurk ecosystem, both on uh, our cloud research toolkit and also uh, by other teams. However, this solution didn't remain effective for very long. 
Toward the middle of 2019, similar patterns of bad data began to crop up again on Mechanical Turk. And at that point, it became evident that location tracking was no longer effective and that foreign account, accounts um, adapted and learned how to bypass these measures almost entirely. It was at that point that we started to approach this problem in a uh, different way. Rather than blocking traffic from IP addresses and geolocations, we now aimed to identify specific problematic accounts and to separate bad respondents from the good ones at the account level. To do that, we started working on an ambitious project. And this is really the project that uh, I'm talking about today. To check each account in the Mechanical Turk pool. We did this by developing technological and behavioral instruments to detect and block problematic respondents. Um, and we call this uh, system that we developed Sentry. Sentry consists of two main components. Uh, there's a technological component and then there's a behavioral component. Technological components include monitoring IP addresses and geolocations, which still remain useful, although they are no longer sufficient by themselves. Uh, Sentry also uses digital fingerprinting, which looks at the unique signature of a respondent's computer. Uh, Sentry also has an event streamer, which allows us to see if people are copying and pasting, translating text, and looking for uh, and looks for other suspicious mouse and keyboard events. That's on the technological side. On the behavioral side, uh, we've developed several instruments and have every Turker complete several closed-ended and open-ended data quality measures in order to be eligible to participate in cloud research hits. Some of the methods for Century are described in our recent paper and were validated on samples at both outside of Mechanical Turk and on Mechanical Turk itself. Um, and a paper outlining the effectiveness of this approach was just accepted uh, to uh, APOR, the American Association for Public, for Public Opinion Research. Uh, we'll be presenting uh, this paper at the upcoming APOR conference in May. And Chesky will provide more details about Century and other parts of our vetting workflow in a few minutes. But before that, I want to provide a top-level overview of how cloud research works alongside Mechanical Turk, focusing on our participant management and data quality tools. And so, as Aaron mentioned, cloud research created participant management tools, uh, we call this the uh, toolkit, for sampling directly from Mechanical Turk. These tools allow researchers to run Mechanical Turk studies in more robust and flexible ways than if they were running studies directly from their own Mechanical Turk account. So for example, let's say a researcher wants to run a longitudinal study. Uh, they can do that using the cloud research tools. Now, this longitudinal study will have the same exact mTurk sample that the researcher would have gotten had they run that study directly from their own Mechanical Turk account. It would just be much easier to run on cloud research because then you can automatically recontact people from wave one with a single click to invite them for subsequent waves. Now, cloud research also has uh, its own unique pool when sampling from mTurk. And we call this pool the cloud research approved group. Uh, to create the approved group, cloud research vets Mechanical Turk workers and separates Mechanical Turk workers into either what we call the approved group or what we call the blocked group. And the blocked group are respondents who are blocked from accessing studies on cloud research because they do not meet our data quality standards. Now, the approved group are respondents who we vetted and know provide high quality data. And we will talk about each of these three groups, uh, right? The block group, the approved group, and what you can expect when sampling directly from mTurk. We'll talk about that um, in subsequent slides. And in particular, we'll focus on the kinds of data quality that you can expect when sampling from each one of these three groups. But I first want to address some other practical questions about the cloud research approved group. Uh, the first question I want to address is, well, how can the approved group be accessed when you're setting up your study? The second question is, what's the size and demographics of the approved group in relation to the larger mechanical or pool? And finally, then we'll come back and talk about the kinds of data quality that can be expected when using the approved group. So how can the cloud research approved group be accessed? 
Now, as you can see here on the slide, the approved group is easily accessible on the cloud research interface. Uh, it is the default setting, in fact, when setting up the uh, hit through the cloud research platform. Uh, and by the way, incidentally, I want to mention that this is our new interface uh, and is now available. Um, uh, we, we just rolled it out in the last couple of weeks. We're very excited about it. And uh, we think that you'll find it a much improved user experience for those who were using us uh, previously. And we'd love to actually hear your feedback about it. Um, and so now let's come back to this question of the size of the cloud research approved group. As we described in our recent paper, Mechanical Turk has about 100,000 unique participants per year. Close to 30,000 unique workers participate on Mechanical Turk every month, and MTurk adds about 5,000 new people to the pool each month. What cloud research does is that it examines the activity of over 85% of this Mechanical Turk, Active Mechanical Turk group. And we have currently approved uh, around 50,000 people to be part of our cloud research approved group. And that means that when you sample for the, from the approved group, you're sampling from a pool of about 50,000 active people. We add around 4,000 new people to this group every single month. And here are some examples of demographic comparisons between our uh, cloud research approved participants and the general demographics of the MTurk pool. And so let's start with gender. Historically, close to around 50% of all hits on Mechanical Turk are completed by men. As you can see on this figure, over the last four years, an uh, on average, women complete between 50 and 53% of hits. And this is based on about 25 million completed surveys. Among our cloud research approved workers, the gender distribution of completed hits is also around 50-50. And so this generally uh, demonstrates that the gender distribution of the cloud research approved group is very similar to the larger mechanical search pool. The distribution of age does not differ by more than, by more than a few percentage points uh, between MTurk and the cloud research approved group, group as well. We know historically that age skews somewhat toward younger people on Mechanical Turk, with the average age being around 40 years old. And this is pretty much exactly what we see among uh, the cloud research approved group as well. The racial uh, distribution is also very uh, similar. White and minority groups do not differ by more than a few percentage points. Uh, there are a few percentage points, fewer Asian and Hispanic participants, uh, but there are more biracial participants on the cloud research approved group. And so on the whole, the racial uh, and ethnic distribution seems very similar. The same is true for education, and this is particularly noteworthy. Uh, we were very careful to design our stimuli to not be biased against lower education respondents, as Husky will talk about in a few minutes. Previous research has shown that many attention checks are passed at a higher rate by uh, college-educated participants and participants from higher socioeconomic status uh, groups. But we do not see evidence of this in our cloud research approved pool. We also do not see, don't see differences uh, in political orientation. And these are just some of the demographics that we selected for this particular presentation. We actually monitor dozens of other demographic variables and generally don't see demographic differences when comparing our cloud research approved participants with the larger MTurk population. For those of you who are interested to find out more about the demographics of MTurk, you can check out our recent paper in, um, in TICS, uh, Trends in Cognitive Science, uh, our book chapter, which uh, also goes into uh, a lot of detail about MTurk demographics, and also our interactive tool on our web website with which you can look at dozens, uh, probably even hundreds of demographics and create cross tabs in real time on our website. Uh, the URL will be, will be available uh, with the resource list. Okay, so now, now let's uh, turn to probably what is the most important question, which is, well, what kind of uh, data quality can people expect when using the cloud research approved group? To examine the data quality of the cloud research approved group, uh, we conducted a study in collaboration with uh, David Hauser from Queens University to examine the type of data quality uh, that can be expected from the cloud research approved, approved participants. Data were collected from three different groups. The first group collected data exclusively from the cloud research approved workers. Uh, the second group collected data exclusively from the 
block list. And the third group was open to the entire Mechanical Turk pool. Uh, the data were collected in November with 300 people in each condition. Uh, the study took about 15 minutes to complete on average, and uh, the study was pre-registered on OSF uh, be beforehand. Um, the study used multiple checks of data quality uh, that allow us to directly compare data quality across the three uh, methods of sampling. And what you're seeing on this slide is that uh, we asked people, for example, to describe what they see on each picture. Uh, the response uh, had to be written out. And so uh, on the cloud research approved part uh, participants, they correctly indicated that the bottles contained wine 99% of the time. Uh, the image on the left was described correctly 98% of the time, and the Jeopardy image was described correctly 96% of the time. Overall, 95% of participants uh, described all three pictures correct from the cloud research group. For the other conditions, uh, the data were very different. Only about 25% described all three pictures correctly, and this obviously highlights the major difference in terms of what can be expected uh, in terms of data quality from these three groups. Uh, we see very similar effects at the group level. Uh, so for example, in the trolley dilemma, people were randomly assigned to either the classic condition or the footbridge condition. And I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with these versions of the trolley dilemma. But just as a quick reminder, in the classic version of the trolley, people have a choice of rerouting a train that's about to run over and kill five people onto a track where it will kill one person instead. Uh, in the footbridge version, on the other hand, people are asked whether they would push a man off a bridge in front of a train in order to save five people. The findings uh, in the general literature are very robust, and they show that the majority of people um, in the classic version turn the trolley, but the majority of people in the footbridge version, version do not push the person off the bridge. What we're seeing here is that this is exactly what we're finding. We're replicating that exact, that exact effect among the cloud research approved participants, but not the blocked group or the MTurk open samples. And this replication failure among those two groups is very noteworthy because uh, these trolley dilemma effects are very robust and typically replicate with very high effect sizes. Um, and again, this failure to replicate the trolley dilemma effects is actually something that we've seen and consistently documented over the last two years among problematic respondents. Finally, the last measure that I want to tell you about from the study uh, is um, what we call the uh, soda anchoring task. Uh, and in this task, participants are presented with a scenario and uh, simply are asked how much they would be willing to pay for a soda. The between groups manipulation is that some people think the soda comes from a rundown convenience store, and others think that it comes from a fancy resort. People typically are willing to pay more for the soda from the fancy resort than a rundown convenience store. And this is exactly what we find among the cloud research approved participants. But we don't replicate this effect among the other two groups. Now, these data points that I just shared with you are just, uh, are just a small subset of the study that we uh, conducted with David Hauser. Uh, but across all measures of that study, uh, we see a very similar pattern of results, basically showing something very similar, that sampling from cloud research, uh, from the cloud research approved group results in dramatically better data quality compared to the block list or from sampling directly from the MTurk sample. Uh, I should also add that we routinely conduct similar spot checks to make sure that data quality remains consistently high uh, on the cloud research approved group. And overall, we've learned to expect at least 95% of cloud research approved group data to be of very high quality. Uh, and that is something that all of you can also expect when using the cloud research approved group. Um, just as an example, uh, very recently, we saw a few tweets uh, by researchers who we thought we would share, who were using cloud research, the cloud research approved group and were very happy with the data. For example, one person described, uh, described, uh, described it as, uh, quote, the most flawless and accurate responses they ever collected in a consumer behavior study. Another person collected data from over a thousand cloud research approved uh, workers and reported issues with fewer than 1% of participants. And we are, of course, very gratified uh, to hear that kind of positive feedback. And we're very thankful for those of you who share your positive experiences online. Uh, but at the same time, if any of you ever see data quality lower than that, 
then please let us know. We will work with you to try to understand what happened and interactions with researchers who use our platform have been invaluable in helping us to improve our data quality tools. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Husky, who will provide more details about the Cloud Research Approved Group. Thanks, Leib. So as you've just seen, data quality among Cloud Research Approved participants is very high and much higher than the open sample recruited from MTurk while the demographics of the Cloud Research Approved participants and of MTurk on the whole do look pretty similar. Now, when starting to create the approved list, we began by thinking about the tension between two contrasting values, perfectly clean data or perfectly free access to all potential participants. And on the extreme ends, you can choose to either let just let everyone in and not affect the sampling pool at all, or you can create over the top intensive screening and only recruit a particular kind of superhuman participant. And our goal was to create and maintain a vetting process that balances these values and provides terrific data without limiting the sample and preventing good participants who aren't superhuman from staying in. And to this end, we developed a vetting system that has five main parts. We analyze open ends to detect low quality responses. We open many different kinds of hits very frequently, some of which serve as traps that draw in dishonest respondents. We also monitor various kinds of suspicious worker activity. Um, just as an example, some workers who don't take hits, um, but rather go from study to study submitting wrong secret codes, uh, completion codes, are preying on kind-hearted or busy researchers hoping to just be approved for some of the hits that they take. So we find and stop this and other kinds of suspicious behavior. And as Leigh mentioned, we also rely on feedback from you, researchers using cloud research. Uh, many researchers use our universal exclude list feature and block workers from taking any of their future studies that way. And we follow up with workers who are put on this exclude list and then are able to determine whether or not they should be permanently kept out of our cloud research approved group. But all of these above processes are not nearly enough on their own. And they're really secondary to Sentry, which is the vetting instrument that does the heaviest lifting. So what is Sentry? Uh, as Leib began to describe, Sentry is a data quality filtration system that identifies high and low quality participants using validated behavioral stimuli and technology, and it's been patented. Um, and Sentry identifies the quality of respondent data based on levels of attention, basic language proficiency, engagement, honesty, and internal consistency. And Sentry is a tool that we've been developing for several years, and I want to give you a little bit of background on that. About five years ago, we started working on our Prime Panels platform um, that Aaron mentioned a little bit about, which aggregates data from over 100 different online panels of varying quality. And in order to clean up the messy data from all these different market research providers so that we could offer access only to high quality participants, we researched and developed a vetting process that all workers had to pass through before taking studies on Prime Panels. And several years ago, we published a paper with Jesse Chandler that show that this method yields high quality survey participants. And since that time, we've been building out our Sentry tool. And we furthered some of this work recently in a paper that's up on MedArchives, it's now under review, that shows how a recent finding published in the CDC's journal that garnered a lot of media attention was actually driven by low quality data. And our paper demonstrates that Sentry cleans up this kind of data and leads to more accurate conclusions. And links to these papers are in the resource list that we'll share at the end of our presentation. But both of these papers have some more background on the behavioral stimuli that are used in Sentry. And to clean up the MTurk pool, what we did was we took Sentry and we implied, we applied it to the entire MTurk population and vetted all the participants. So when a participant passes through Sentry, they see instructions and a short series of behavioral stimuli. And while participants are interacting with these stimuli, technology like digital fingerprinting also helps us see beyond IP addresses and see through VPNs to detect and remove problematic respondents who are sharing the same computers or servers. And there are many different types of stimuli in Sentry, including multiple choice and open-ended questions, as well as assessments of attention, willingness to engage and put effort into survey responses, and honesty checks. And in the process of building Sentry, we tested thousands of items and now have a very large library of tested and validated items. And this enables, enables us to present unique sets of stimuli to each participant that we vet. And our goal in creating and testing these stimuli was to become maximally efficient at correctly identifying high quality participants. And we now know that Sentry calls the right kinds of participants and that 
non-problematic respondents can actually get all these questions correct. And as the data that Leib showed us, these stimuli are not biased against any particular demographic groups, which was an important part of the creation process. And in our testing process, we iteratively examined different question difficulty levels and different mixes of specific kinds of questions until we found the optimal mix of questions that maximize the quality of our participants. And again, more details of our methodology are reported in our paper on that archives. But taken together, these sentry questions alongside the other data quality vetting that we do helps us remove low quality participants in a fair way. And this is how we maintain our pool of cloud research approved participants. And as a final point, vetting of participants is not the only thing that can impact data quality on the study level. Even rigorous vetting can't guarantee perfect quality data, and that's because there are a few best practices that you have to keep in mind at the study level. Now, likely most of you are very aware of these issues and on, on top of these sorts of best practices, but let's just review a couple. First, uh, you have to give participants very clear instructions in both the hit description and the study details. You have to advertise and describe your hit to participants accurately, including accurate study length and a description of any part of your hit that's out of the ordinary workflow on MTurk. Also, you have to pay participants adequately for the time and effort that you expect them to put in. Additionally, every researcher has a reputation on MTurk. This is partially visible on the MTurk dashboard, and it's also on other websites that workers frequent. And many high quality participants actually avoid studies from requesters with bad reputations or very high rejection rates. And you should always also use proper pre-screening procedures and good methods for targeting specific demographics so that you're not incentivizing participants to lie. And one of the blogs that we uh, is also linked on the resource list that we'll be sharing in just a minute gives more detail about each of these best practices. But the key message here is that the worse the user experience is for participants, the worse the data is going to be. And this is because participants are humans who get frustrated when they're not treated well, feel misled, or otherwise thrown off by a task. So when you have a study with very high dropout, it's usually because some of these best practices are not being followed. And in such cases, high quality participants drop out and the data that you're left with can be messy. But if you do keep these best practices in mind and use the cloud research approved participants, you're gonna get very high quality data. And with that, I turn things over to Aaron for conclusions. All right, thanks, Keski. So I know our presentation today has contained a lot of information. And I want to take just a minute to try to summarize the main points. So as we talked about in the beginning, until 2018, uh, Mechanical Turk was a reliable place for researchers to gather high quality data. But then in 2018, some issues with data quality emerged, and some of those issues continue on the platform to this day. Using behavioral and technological tools that we told you about, Cloud Research has screened about 85% of the active MTurk population and separated participants who provide quality data from those that do not. Our approved group has about 50,000 people in it, and the demographics and data quality of people in this group looks much like what researchers were able to uh, gather on Mechanical Turk before 2018. And then finally, as Kesky was just talking about, measuring and maintaining data quality is complex, and often the best solutions are multifaceted. The work we put into approving participants on MTurk goes a long way towards improving data quality, but there are other factors that are important as well. I want to say that although we presented a lot of information today, it was uh, just a small percentage of the data and information that we have available. So if you, your lab, or your department would benefit from a different presentation or perhaps just a conversation about the work that you're doing, we'd be more than happy to schedule a meeting with you. We often find the most uh, valuable thing for both researchers and for us is to simply talk, uh, sit down and talk about the work that people are doing. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.